Man, Father God, thank you for this word, Father God, that you're going to bring to us today by your Holy Spirit. We thank you that your word continue to be life to us, Father God. It just bring meaning of who you are and who we are in you, Father. I thank you that it continue to encourage us in these times and in these days, Father God. Encourage us to build our relationship with you and with one another, Father God. We thank you that this is important to us, Father God. This is our very life that we study this word daily. And you give us this opportunity to come together on Wednesday nights. We thank you, Father God, for your salvation that come, came through your son, Jesus Christ. And in him dying, Father God, you was able to depart your very self, your spirit to each and every one of us. Father God, you knew we would need help in this word. So you gave us yourself, your Holy Spirit called the spirit of truth. It's our advocate, Father God. Your word said it, it, it reminds us of all things. It's our teacher. And Father God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit in each and every one of us, Father God. We ask you to clear our minds and our hearts. Lord, forgive us of any sin, every trespass that we've done today, Father God, that we may put them, Father God, under your blood, Father God. And also, Father God, things that we know that we've done that we shouldn't have done, we repent. Not to go back to those things, Father God, but we press forward to our hot calling in Christ Jesus. And Father God, we just thank you, Lord, leading God us through this study as we go again in the book of John, chapter 4. Father God, and let your truth be revealed to us. Give us something to live off of, Father God. We thank you. We honor you in your precious holy name. Amen. Amen. So I wanted to start. Um, I want to give a little history because last week when we was talking about Samaria um, and we were in the book of Isaiah and Sister Sylvia is found in the book of Isaiah, book of Jeremiah, which coincide with that also in first and second Chronicles. First and second Kings are his writing of the Kings. Um, and I wanted to kind of give you an, an idea going back to some of her studies about because I love what she did. And I, she kind of encouraged us to go online and kind of print off some things because she was saying she don't know how long this information is going to be there. But um, just wanted to kind of start talking about Assyria, the Syrians, how they became. Now, um, remember going back to David and then his son Solomon, right? And then after Solomon's death, the kingdom split and God gave them prophecy this will happen because of their rebellion. So the kingdom did split into the northern and the southern kingdoms. And and that is interesting because you will see the city of Samaria here. And going back, I had an opportunity to go online and read some of the um, the the original Hebrew Bible from the original Hebrew Bible, what Samaritans come from. And um, if you look at the and looking at those two kingdoms that split after Solomon, you had the northern kingdom and you had the southern kingdom. But interesting in the northern kingdom, we call this the kingdom of Judah. Remember, the northern kingdom had two tribes, the kingdom of Judah and, sorry, from the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. Those two tribes of the 12. And in that, you had this king Rehoboam that she talked about. That was Solomon's son. Solomon had two sons, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And I don't expect you remember all of this, but I always love to go back to this because it brings things to light. And if you start reading about that, you will see what's going on in today's time even when it talks about this war, not to say for or against, but you're going to be surprised when you read that. Um, and, and the capital city of the north of the southern kingdoms, um, Judah and Benjamin, was Jerusalem. Now, that's going to come into importance when we start talking about the Samaritan woman, even where they talk about where they worship. So just to give you similarity, so again, the no southern kingdom, well, I say the northern kingdom first. We like to go to north and south. Northern kingdom was Jeroboam. I always like to start with the southern kingdom because they did a little bit better with God. <laughs> so the southern kingdom was the, uh, from the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. Um, there, the capital city was Jerusalem. Um, the first king there was Jeroboam. Sorry, I said Jeroboam. Rehoboam. Sorry, Rehoboam. Um, the temple, they worship in the temple in Jerusalem. They had a Levitical priesthood. She read through us Second Chronicles all the way out like, at 1310. You'll see where they came from. Um, the dynasties there, there was only one king that the, everyone came from, the sea, and that was the king of David, his royal line. They had a lot of rulers, and she talked about that in the book of Isaiah and the book of uh, Jeremiah. You can see that first and second king, first and second chronicles. Of um, out of the 20 kings, five were godly, eight or nine was good. 
and one was good, but he, you know, went bad. He repented. So that's why they say that. Uh, record, you can read back in 1 Kings and 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. Um, this is important. The southern kingdom, when they were led into captivity, they were led into Babylon. Remember that. That's the southern kingdom the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. Had some good kings there, all from the lineage of David. David's son that tried to fall out to him, Rehoboam. In the northern kingdom were the other 10 remaining tribes, Jeroboam. Going back to what Sister Sylvia talked, so not Rehoboam, but Jeroboam. Solomon's other, Solomon's, I'm sorry, I said Solomon's son, Solomon's servant, sorry. That was Solomon's servant. Remember, he rebelled. Um, this capital city, and this is important if you look at the map today, Shechem, later called Samaria. So the northern kingdom, the capital, I'm going to read you in a minute, it was Samaria. It was known as the kingdom of Samaria. The kingdom of Israel was technically known as the kingdom of Samaria, even in today's Greek literature and Hebrew literature. Now, instead, when it comes to worship, and we're going to see that in chapter four that we're going to read in John, when it comes to worship, the southern kingdom worship in the temple in Jerusalem where God provided a place to worship. The northern kingdom, they worship golden calves. Matter of fact, they had two built. We're talking about Bethel and Dan. And I'm going to read that to you. Priests, instead of Levitical priesthood, like the southern kingdom, they had idolatrous priests. And you see that in 2 Chronicles 2. It all starts in 2 Chronicles chapter 13. You see in verse 10, you're talking about the, the southern kingdom with the good prophets. And then about chapter, uh, verse 13, they're talking about these wicked prophets. Um, actually, start in verse 9. I'm sorry. So instead of one, the dynasty, the southern kingdom had David as king. The southern kingdom had many different king, king, kings. As a matter of fact, some of them was from foreign gods. They weren't all from Israel. Their captives brought in kings that they wanted. Wonderful thing. I'm just doing this because they really have a lot of what we're talking about here. Um, the rulers, all 19 of Israel kings were idolatry, fell into idolatry. They all worshiped idols. They all led the people away from God to be continually punished and brought into captivity. Now, the exile, instead of exile, remember this southern kingdom ex was exiled in captivity to Babylon that she went over. The captivities of northern kingdom, they were led into captivity into Assyria. Assyria. And that's in 2 Kings. Both of those you would find in 2 Kings um, chapter 17 through uh, chapter 30, 25, 17 through 25. But I want to re go over that because when we're talking about Samaritans, we're not talking about people that did not belong to Israel. Now, I'm going to read this to you. This is some of the stuff that she read to us that I had to put in my notes here. <clears throat> Samaria was a region and kingdom in the northern part of the ancient Israel land. And it had a complex relationship with the rest of Israel. Samaria was the capital kingdom, the capital of the kingdom of Israel also known as the Northern Kingdom, from about 880 to 720 BC. The, king, the kingdom was established after the death of King Solomon. We just said that. When the Northern tribes separated from the Southern tribes, the kingdom was often stronger and more economically developed than Judah, the Southern tribe, but was conquered by the Assyrians. And that was in 760. 722 BC. Samaritans again. Samaritans were a community that emerged out of the Assyrian conquest. So these were Israelites that were captured, led into captivity by the Assyrians. When foreign populations settled in this region of Samaria, they intermarried with the remaining Israelites. You remember the king of Assyria brought in other people from other regions. The Samaritans claim partial descendant from the Israelite tribe Ephraim and Manasseh or Dan. So 
when she goes, when she says my people, she's talking about the Israelites. They were descendants of Israel, but they developed their own religious and ethnic identity. The Samaritans also built the temple in North Gergesim. And that's why she said, my people worship here. The Israelites worship over there. We're, we're going to go through that. We're going to see that in just a second. When they believe, <laughs> then, which they believe, was the location chosen by Moses. So the Samaritans, when they were worshiping in their place, in Gerizim, they thought that was a place that Moses chose to worship God. And they thought that was more holier than in Jerusalem, where the Israelites were also worshiping God. While the Jews believed that the temple of Je temple was in uh, Jerusalem, and we're going to see that through the, the lesson we read through the scriptures, was their only legitimate place of worship. And you know, already know, we talked about the Jews and the Samaritans, they feuded. Um, they thought there was in, the, the Jews thought there was in a, a continuous state of uh um, impurity because they worship these other gods, but they were part of the people. Matter of fact, the Samaritans had a high priest. And I was looking at that today that was still recognized today as an Israelite priest. Matt, they got scrolls and stuff written just like Israelite priest. And it's still, uh, uh, matter of fact, it said it came from starting with the Hebrews prophet Aaron. Now that's amazing. And that's the part of this Samaritan tradition and their culture and community. And the high priest there was without interrupt. He, matter of fact, he reigned for they, these high priests of, of um, Samaritan. They, they were for 36,000 years they reigned. And they got writing, starting with the Hebrew prophet Aaron they was a part of. So when we talk about Samaria, they were really feuding and had prejudice honestly against their own people. And I just want to bring that out. You know, we talked about how the Jewish people go around, you know, Samaria to get to Jordan or whatever they were traveling to. They would make it a place. They, you know, ostracize these people. But they were a part of the northern, the um, the tribe there, the, the, the northern tribe here. So that's where, you know, that come from, you know, about the Samaritans. So the Samaritans wasn't as outcast as we think they were, but they had some issues early on in history. They were technically brothers. And, you know, looking back how the tribe divided themselves in the northern southern kingdom. But it was interesting to know that Samaria, Samaria was the capital. It was the capital of the northern tribes. That really is something. So... And it goes a lot into that, too. If you actually look online, you'll see where some Syria is, where um, there, Gaza, Gaza is a part of that. And, and it's Jordan, all of that kind of stuff. Who divided, who had what, and all this kind of stuff. It got, kind of got me a little bit because then when you look at kind of what's going on today, we'll not get into that, but nobody's uh, we'll, we'll get into that. But you see how there's two sides of this thing. And God's, that's not going to settle, get settled to God come back. And there's a lot of wrong when people say it's right. Hey, anybody want to comment on that? I just want to give you a little history. So when we're talking about Samaritans, you know that they were a part of the tribe of uh, the other 10 remaining tribes in the northern kingdom. And they were the capital of Israel. These people from the capital of Israel, they were defiled, however, because when they were conquered, um, this southern kingdom, so the, the southern king were conquered by the Babylonians. The northern king were conquered by the Assyrians. The Syrian king brought in foreigners to mix with the Israelites. And that's why they thought they were defiled. But if you look at what Sister Sylvia taught, you go back and look at some of those studies, both sides were evil. I'm going to leave that alone. But you got to go back to what she was. God had to punish both. There was a reason why both led, were led into captivity, really, for the same reason. They rejected God's um, um, rule. Um, they were rebellious. They rebelled. They were disobedient. So one can't put themselves above another. And God actually, Jesus actually told us that, too, when he came back. So read the Bible. <laughs> okay. So any comments on that? Please. <clears throat> Okay, so we stopped and we said we're going to start back at, um, we talked about the living water. So we're going to read from 10, probably 
on down far way farther than we're going to get today but just as you know get you a sense of you know this conversation that christ had with the samaritan woman um knowing now you know history why he wasn't afraid to deal those were actually his people as well kind of surprising but we consider don't you know apart from him and i say that because remember we talked about last time how we can prejudge people before we get to know them See, we thought they were evil people that roamed around. They had nothing to do with the part of Israel and all that kind of stuff. And no, Jesus went into his own too. He had to go into all of his own. He went into the high priestly territory, the temple and all that, but he still had to visit all of his people of the 12 tribes. So in verse 10 of chapter four, it said, Jesus answered and said unto her. So let's go back. I apologize. So in, in, in verse eight, uh, disciples were going away in the city to buy meat. And verse nine, and 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 then Jesus said unto the Samaritan woman, unto him, and said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou being a Jew, ask it drink of me, when I am a woman of Samaria? The Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. And we just read the walk. Remember, if you go back, she was at Jacob's well. Jacob's well, chapter in verse six, he came into the city of Samaria called Sikar, near the parcel ground of Jacob that he gave to Joseph. Now, if you look at that, it said, now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary of his journey, uh, and then that's the sixth hour, then he asked his woman to give him. Now, if you go back to that Jacob well, that's when Jacob's name would change. It would change from Jacob to Israel. And that's very important. You know, he was, and that was symbolism of what God was doing to his people. It wasn't just about Jacob. God was taking him from a rejected people, a people of, they were supplanters, all of us, you know, tricksters, you know, in and out with God to standing now Israel in right standing with God. He was trying to say he's bringing us to that right standing place in him. So when Jesus asked this Samaritan woman for water, and, you know, the Samaritan woman, knowing that the Dillons, that this, this feud that they had um, with the Jews, said, how be it, you know, you're a Jew, you're different. You gonna ask me for water? You know, you shouldn't be doing that. And Jesus asked her and said in verse 10, Jesus asked her and said unto her, if thou knowest the gift of God, and whom it is that saith unto thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. And we pointed out last time that Jesus considered himself a gift of God. And a gift is something that was given away. Matter of fact, it has more benefit to of the receiver than it does the person who is given or did the gift itself being the person who's given it. So, you know, so he considers himself, but he also considered himself like a water poured out, an offering poured out for us. So he considered himself a gift from God. He did not put himself above him. We read that before, but he said he's here to do the will of his father. And we talked about also that we are considered gifts as God. <laughs> and Sister Stokes also, we brought it out with her question that we minister, we talking to people, we should consider ourselves a gift of God. Another sister last week too, I think Sister Campbell printed that out. That we meet people, we are a gift of God that he brings to people. God wants himself to be seen through us. So we're a gift from God given to people. So when we interact with people, we ought to represent the gift giver. God, not ourselves. That's why he called us ambassadors. We went into this living water and we went into um, um, two scriptures in particular. We went into Jeremiah 23, I think, um, Someone read that um, and that in Isaiah 12, 3. I think it was Stokes and Sister Catherine. I'm going to just read over that. It says in uh, Jeremiah uh, 2, 13, it went on, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and have hewed out cisterns, broken cisterns that hold no water. And in Isaiah 12, 3, therefore the joy Therefore, excuse me, therefore with joy shall ye drink, draw water from the well of salvation. 
draw water out of the well of salvation. And we talked about that well of salvation is Christ. When we draw from Christ, we can only draw from him through a relationship. And as we are constant in our relationship with Christ grows, we draw from him life. All the life that Christ has in him that were placed in him by his father, we draw that out in our relationship with him. You can only draw it out through relationship. You know, you can't draw it out by being religious. You have, as you have relationship with God, there's a continual drawing out from him, from life to life. Okay. And we talked about that. And then I think we ended in um, the book of Numbers talking about uh, Moses in chapter 20, when Christ told him to, he wanted to sanctify his people. He wanted to show them his faithfulness by giving them providing their needs at that time, which was physical water, but he wanted to show them that he's also their spiritual provider. And he gave Moses and Aaron particular uh, um, directions what to do to the rock. He said to speak to the rock, Christ said, I would draw out my living water so I can feed and, and so I can give water to my people so that I can sanctify them, which means Build that relationship. Let them see that it is God who gives it. Is it. All your blessings come from God. We read how Moses, unfortunately, was a little disobedient. He was angry with the people. He called them some rebels. And he went before the people. He got a little angry. And he always tells us to be angry, but don't sin, which means don't do nothing that's going to separate us from what God told us to do now. So Moses, he did what? He smoked the rock. And God said, because of this, you disobeyed me. I was coming to show my people who I was. You got up there. All they did was saw what you did. Now their eyes on you. So guess what? You're not going to enter into the land that I promised you and your forefathers. And that's where we stopped. Okay. Uh, any comments on any of that? Please. <coughs> any comments on any of that? Yeah. Go ahead, Tony. You want me to? You know, when you spoke about Moses, Pastor Dave, you know how sometimes when you read that story, you think all that Moses did. I used to think all that Moses did. How, mm -hmm. how, oh, how could the Lord just allow him, you know, all, I mean, he dealt with these rebellious, complaining, mm -hmm. bickering. Oh, my goodness. The word can. And he didn't even he didn't even get to um, cross over into the promised land. But mm -hmm. but it shows you that disobedience is costly and it Amen. say that again is costly disobedience is very costly mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and while he you know a lot of times people you know even when i because disobedience it doesn't end well if you keep living a certain way and it's contrary to what the lord has told us to do or he gives you something to do and you don't do it or he tells you to do it a certain way and mm -hmm. you don't execute it that way then the disobedience is that's what that's that's what that points out to me that you walk after the lord's ways his statues you 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 always keep your eyes on him and oh anyway i just want to comment on that that's good and that means disobedience is costly at any point in time at any all. point in mm -hmm. time yeah. God. you can't get so high mighty that you slip you think you all that because you know some of us I, i'm excuse me me i apologize <laughs> I'm a, I'm 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 a minute away from, from you know being unrighteous, you know, getting out of God's will. Sometimes people just take me the wrong way and I get upset and I'd be like, you know what? I was talking to a brother today, was sitting there saying, sometimes we just want to tell God, now you know that person ain't right. You need to just let me do this for one God, you know. And we're just like Moses, we're not above him. Now, that doesn't mean Moses wasn't saved now. That doesn't mean that we're not saved. That don't mean that we're not. Enter into, we're going to, you know, it, 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 the eternal life with God. But it means that some of the things that he have for us, you, we may not get. And that's scary because, you know, sometimes it lead us to know that sometimes even in our Christian or believers walk, we're sometimes at a state that we're in because of us. Has nothing to do with the devil. It's the decisions that we make. And sometimes... Me, I, I feel them sometimes. I know when I cut up and I slip and I said, God, I just missed something, didn't I? He said, yeah, boy, you sure did. 
And I said, well, I'm going to get it right. So the next time you come and test me like that, I'm going to enter into your rest and into your kingdom. <clears throat> and into Pastor, your kingdom. Pastor Dave. Yes, sir. I, I was telling Patricia how Moses was, he was the leader of, of um, God's people back then. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, as, how the word says, much is given, much is required. So mm -hmm. much authority the Lord gives us, the, the, the more is required of us, a higher standard is required of us. Mm -hmm, That's what mm -hmm. I'm seeing in that too, because um, the influence that something would have over someone that's you know in min in ministry or are with us a brother and sister mm -hmm. that that is under us so to speak the influence good or bad that would have so mm -hmm. yeah that that is so important to um remember and humbly to, to yeah. remember mm -hmm. that amen amen that's a double amen <laughs> Okay, before we're gonna, I want to um, kind of gear a little bit too because last week we talked about this living water, and we referred to John ten. Sorry, John four. We went back a little bit. Gift of God, this living water, and we also look back at John three, three through eight. When he had this conversation with Nicodemus, he said in chapter verse five in chapter three, he said, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I wanted to rest there just for a second, take about five, five or 10 minutes or so. We're going to talk about just before we go on about the kingdom of God. I want this to be, um, as the Holy Spirit given to me, solid in our mind, because when we talk about the kingdom of God, we thinking about heaven now we're going to talk about the kingdom of god and his influence what that kingdom mean because he wants his kingdom jesus said that he want with that we should pray that his will be done his kingdom come to earth and be seen here and we are to live in this kingdom that he gave us to dominate and we are to colonize it in a way i know some people think that's a negative word it's not colonize this kingdom here that it looks like that of the kingdom of heaven so that the kingdom of heaven he said your kingdom come your will be done so when he was talking about this kingdom he said you cannot enter into the kingdom itself by water and also by the spirit talking about we said the water here that makes it now plain we didn't go into that before because i wanted to wait but now that water, he's talking about that water that comes from Christ, that living water, that water of salvation, that water that brings true life that he says in the scripture. And also, you know, he talks about that water that when we do that, we're entering into the kingdom of God. Without that, we cannot enter. Now, he's not talking about going to heaven. Man, we already said that there is no scripture in the Bible talking about us going to heaven. God's going to, that new Jerusalem going to come here. We're going to rule here because that's what he created us to do. Rule here on this earth. There was a new Jerusalem that would come from heaven. You would not, nor I would take over heaven. That's God's throne. But his kingdom, we're going to talk about that, what that kingdom means, should and will come to earth. Not after just when he come, but also now. So when we enter into a relationship with God, we repent we're returning back to our former selves because we were predestined ephesians in him even before we were born before the beginning of this world we were in christ so now we're returning to a state of being that we can exist in our former state in christ what was that like so this kingdom and i gave you this we're talking about the kingdom before i just want to reiterate going back to my notes of that <laughs> The kingdom here is the governing influence. So what are you talking about entering to his kingdom? It's the governing influence of a king over a territory. So that territory, and that's why he says, whatever ground that we tread upon, we take in his name because that become kingdom territory. You and I become kingdom. So that your neighborhood, your house, when you're there, when you represent the king, it becomes the kingdom of God. We're going to talk about that a little later. On your job, enter in you, if you dwell in this, in the kingdom of God, we're going to talk about when you go into your job, the kingdom of God goes with you. 
You don't have, you're not representing yourself. You represent the king. So it's the governing influence of a king over a territory, impacting it with his personal will, purpose, and intent. It's a sovereign royal government. That's why he called us even a royal priesthood, producing a culture, a value, morals, and lifestyle that is reflecting the king's desire and nature for a culture. So when we say enter into the kingdom, he's talking about a, a, a place that he governed, his influence over our lives. When we're unbelievers, we're under the enemy's territory. We're, when we're rebirth, we enter into the kingdom of God by his son, that living water, and also by the spirit, the big S, his Holy Spirit, usher us in. That's why he said, don't blaspheme the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit is the one that's going to speak to you to get you to the, the king, which is Christ, to get you in the kingdom. If you blaspheme and don't believe in him, you can't even come to me, Christ. Because that's the Holy Spirit blaspheming, speaking against him, unbelief. You can't even come to Christ. You can't even come to the living water without the one who call us into that water or to that water. So he says here in Matthew 18, 3 and 4, he said, and he said, Christ, I tell you the truth, unless you change and become like little children, you will not ever you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, mindset. It's a culture. It's a territory where God has influence over your life and mine. Matthew 19, 17. There is only one, talking about God, who is good. If you want to enter life, in that kingdom is true life. So if we want to enter the life that God has for us, which is true life, other than that, we're just existing. Our life is in Christ. It will predestined to be in Christ. He said, obey the commandments. That's why I say, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Matthew 19, 23 through 24. I tell you the truth. It is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, he ain't talking about going to heaven. He's talking about entering that kingdom here, that mindset change, that culture, having God influencing you instead of you worrying about thinking your money is your sustainer, your provider, your provision. So when we come into Christ through that living water, we enter into a state, a territory where God's influence his culture, his value, his mores, his lifestyle, it reflected upon us. And he pour out his kingdom upon us and he gives us everything. And the good thing about that, we don't have to worry about what provision we have on earth. I love this because all of his, our resources come from his kingdom. That's why God said, anything you want, I can give you. Because it's not based on what we have here on this earth, it's based on what he has in his kingdom. So we think about that. We're thinking about the king's domain on earth in our lives is God's government, his authority, his system, his rule, his influence, his value, his morals, his culture over our life, his lifestyle. We has, have the lifestyle, the same lifestyle he has in heaven. There's order, there's peace there, there's perfection, there's joy, there's love. So that's entering into that kingdom. It's not no factitious place that when we're going to enter into the kingdom of God. No, God said when you, when you and I come to him and we're born again by Christ, that living water, and the Holy Spirit usher us in to God's presence in his kingdom, our whole lifestyle should change. Now, that's if we submit to the will and authority of the king. See, we still can say all that stuff and still be rebellious and not keep his commandments, which is also his precepts, constructs, his statute. This is his constitution. If we live in a kingdom, every kingdom on earth, same as in heaven, has a constitution. And if you abide by that constitution, you are in upright standing with this as a citizen of, of the king. When you're not, you're not. So you have to abide by the constitution. Any questions on that? Want to just go over that? This is not some fictitious place that Christ, you know, explaining the 
the, the uh, Nicodemus and now this woman at the world are we in truth. He's talking about right now we can experience the kingdom of heaven. We are entering into that. You don't have to wait till you die and go to the bright by and by when we all get to heaven. He's talking about now. That's why some people's lives, even in your life, you can see the kingdom. You can see God's influence, his authority, his rule, his peace, his joy. His very will done in your life. And I know you can. Any questions or concern about that before we go on? Okay, so we're good to go. So now Jesus tells her at the well, if you knew that this gift of God, that I'm the gift of God and the gift that he has in me, you ask me, you will say to me, give me a drink. Because what I have to offer is living water. And we talked about the difference between what was in the well and living water. We're going to get in that. I'm going to ask you a few questions in a second. Verse 11, the woman said to him, sir, thou had nothing to draw with and the well is deep. From whence then has thou the living water? So what was this woman talking about? Opposed to what Christ was talking about. Talk to me. What was this woman talking about still versus what Christ was talking about? She was looking at it in the natural. Mm -hmm. That's what it was. She because it made it made the, a well. I don't know how many people are familiar with the well. A well is mm -hmm. deep, mm -hmm. so you have to have something to draw from the well. But she didn't understand the spiritual. I mean, and and so to me, that's what she would, when she said that to him. It's like almost like what's the what's your problem? We, we can't that can't that can't possibly be. You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Amen. And then verse about five, going back in chapter three, I'm going to I turn to just reference that chapter three, verse five, when he tell, told him the end of that, he said, when except the man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. Verse six says, which is born of flesh is a flesh and which is born of the spirit is spirit. Mm. Marvel not that I said in this. So she's still talking about the flesh. She's talking about a natural yes. water. And then he says here to her, oh, let me turn back over. I jumped over. This woman is speaking to Jesus now. He said, art thou, she said, art thou greater than thy father Jacob? Again, a Samaritan woman, a Samaritan calling her Jacob her father, because remember, they're descendants of them. The Samaritans are descendants of the 10 remaining tribes in the north. Samaria was the capital of Israel. So she also identified with the 12 tribes, knowing that her father and their main stand there, the same thing the Jewish people bet on today. The they said the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They quote, quote their lineage because that's where the promises that God gave to their forefathers. Okay. So say, art thou greater than our father Jacob? Asking Jesus, is he greater than Jacob? <laughs> Because you can give me some water other than what Jacob, this is Jacob's well in this area. Now, th this is what he's buried now. This get, was given for his father to him, you know, uh, going back to Joseph as a gift. And he said, um, which gave us this well. So this is Jacob gave us this well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle. And if you go back to what we read it before, you'll see that that did take place. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of the water, of this water, shall thirst again. So, you know, you can drink this water from the well that your father gave you, Jacob, your forefather Jacob gave you, you're going to thirst again. But, verse 14, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of living, a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So what kind of water is Jesus trying to give her? I mean, it's plain and simple. Yo. It's, it's right in scripture. What kind of water? She's talking about a water <clears throat> to quench your physical thirst. He's talking about a water that will quench a spiritual thirst 
What's the difference here? What kind of water Christ was talking about here? I'll wait for you. He was talking about uh, uh, something spiritual mm -hmm. that only he could provide. Mm -hmm. There you go. The water that he was offering, who did it come from? Going back to verse 10. Where did it come from? It was a gift from who? From God. Yeah. So you rather have the water, he's telling her, from your forefather, Jacob, or you rather have this other water, which is a gift from God, the one that you would know about, that your forefather, Jacob, worshipped, that you should be worshipping. We're going to get to that. We're going to keep reading real quick. So he's offering her something greater. And this water that he's talking about, well, you know, what, kind, what kind of life? So it sh she would never um, run out. Be eternal. Never run. Out. Eternal. Yeah. Eternal. But he's saying this water that he gave her in verse 14, but the water that I shall give him or the person shall be in him a well of living water. It will remain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For eternity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So everlasting well. Yeah. And then the other scripture he said, he said, um, he said that would be a what? A well of of salvation. Mm -hmm. Oh, Isaiah 12, 3. Therefore, the joy with the joy shall ye draw water from the wells of salvation. Mm -hmm. And that salvation is from Christ, life, relationship with him. Stokes, I see a hand. Is he talking about the Holy Spirit? Oh, yeah. The Holy Spirit is in and with us forever. Yeah. The Holy Spirit is a part. Oh, that's a great question. Because the Holy Spirit is a part of that salvation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So why did Christ come? Not a trick question. So I, I give it to you. Yeah, but we're going to talk about the how. Christ came to restore us back to yeah. our dominion mm -hmm. in this kingdom. And I know everybody said, Christ came to die on the cross. No, that was a means to an end. Don't worship the cross. He, that's why he told us don't, don't worship that cross. Don't make a graven image. Because the cross was a mean. After the cross, what did he do? He said, because I come, I want to dwell with you forever and give you eternal life. I must die that I may send another like myself. So Christ came to die, if we think about it that way, so he can di be dispersed in each and every one of us forever. So he can give himself out to every believer that mm -hmm. eternal life. See, it was only one of him, but when he died, he came back in spirit, mm -hmm. the spirit of God. So now he says, Christ said, now get Christ said, guess what? Now I'm the mm -hmm. God and Christ said, I will never leave you anymore or forsake you. I'm going to send another mm -hmm. like myself. Like so you're right. Part of our salvation is the Holy Spirit. We just read that. So let me go back and read that again. Ver chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water. Jesus just said, I'm the living water. And of the Spirit, big S. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So wonderful question. Correct. That's part of our salvation. We get to be washed by God. We get to receive Christ. When we receive Christ, we receive the living water, life forever. And we also receive his Holy Spirit to make sure we can be obedient to him. The same thing Christ did when he was baptized. Good question. Any other comments on that? That was great. Uh, Pastor. Yes, sir. This is actually a metaphor. Of, of salvation is that correct it's, it's yes, not, sir. Like, yes sir yes sir yes sir actually a water but it's a metaphor and, mm -hmm. and christ uses those to uh explain the 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 salvation that is offered to us yes okay I'm, amen because he who's the water 
Who's the living water? Christ. Christ. There you go. So when you drink of him, he said he's life. Drink of him, you have eternal life that can only come from the son. He said we have everlasting life. And in verse 15, he says, the woman said unto him, sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Now, is she still talking about a physical water or a spiritual water or this metaphor that Elder John was talking about? What is she still talking about? What is that in the case? She's still talking about the physical water. Yeah, she's yeah. yeah she's still talking about the physical water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but she said neither. Uh, I won't thirst. Neither I don't have to come and draw no water. Mm -hmm. I don't have to come to this place and draw no more. And sixteen, Jesus said unto her, "Go, call your husband, and come hither." Mm -hmm. Now we're gonna about to get into something now because John mm -hmm. said it's, it's a metaphor, it's similar as a salvation. He's giving you a process of what we have to do. Do we have to deny ourselves? He's giving us a wonderful example here. He mm -hmm. said, Jesus said unto her, go call your husband and come hither. That's the state of all of us in. Backslidden state. Living the way you want to live. Did, now, wait a minute. She was a Samaritan. He under King Jeroboam, her forefathers, of the ten remaining tribes, That was the kingdom of Israel. She mm -hmm. knew, they knew about God. They knew the promise of God. They knew the law. They had the commandments. They just decided they want to do their own thing. You remember they mm -hmm. formed their own religion and their own right. Matter of fact, their king, whew, he was Jeroboam. I wrote all that down. I want to, I want to read it to you because it's long. Jeroboam actually knew to worship God. He started these this idol worship all over the kingdom. Mm -hmm. And demand that people worship these idols. He, mm -hmm. got, he got out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can read you all of that, but it's, you find it in First Kings, there. But it gets really crazy. So call, call, go call your husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, "I have no husband." Jesus said to unto her, "Thou hast well said, I have no husband." Hmm. I'm going to leave that alone and let Joan want to get into that. So she was, I have no husband. And 18, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast now hath is not thy husband, and that said thou truly. I don't know, Joan, you can get out. She was shacking or whatever she was doing, but she, he said you had five. And then the one you with now ain't your husband. So God point out our sin, but we already know our state. We like this woman, we can well say who we are with Christ when we're not with him. See, we know that. People, you don't really have to point out, I didn't, nobody had to really point out my sin. I don't know that mm -hmm. point out yours, but mm -hmm. I, I came and laid mine at the altar before Christ, mm -hmm. like this woman did. I I, I have none. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm in a, lie, a state of lying right now. The life that I'm living is not the mm -hmm. life that you call me unto living. She knew mm -hmm. better. Yeah. Like we knew better. Mm -hmm. And then the woman said unto him, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. And that's interesting. Interesting. So he came with truth and she perceived because prophet at that day, um, not always this day, but a prophet should be foretelling truth. <laughs> You know, most of the time, to be honest with you, if you go back and look at the word of the prophet, the prophet was there because you didn't answer or you and I didn't answer God. God's way was not to send a prophet. He wanted to relate to his people. We mm -hmm. talked about that. We talked about Moses being their leader. Moses was not meant to be their leader. Mm -hmm. Remember, God told Moses to bring my people to the mountain so I can speak and have a relationship to my people. That's why you called them out of Israel. I want to have a relationship with each and every one of them. When God came down to address his people, he came down the mountain road and everything. The people ran. I was like, whoa, wait a minute, Moses. Sure God, I know God came to talk to us, but guess what? You, next thing you know, Moses was standing there by himself. Mm -hmm. yeah. The people said, no, we're going on. You talk to God. 
running away from God. Mm -hmm. Now, not always in fear, but we don't want to do what God say do. And we like having somebody in front of us that give us excuses. So we can say we were following him. No, God say, follow me. That's why mm -hmm. he said the time's going to come that none of us need a teacher. God would be your teacher. Yeah. See, that's his plan that's from true. the beginning. So, and I know that sounds crazy to you, but I want you to go back and read that. He was a messenger of deep. God is always having to, hmm, I don't want to say replan. It's, and I know it's in his plan, but he's always have to do something that's not his original intent. I put it to you that way. He's always have to do something to rescue us. Hmm. But you hmm. see that the people, I mean, please go back and read that. Because when I read it, I tell you a few weeks ago, it blew my mind. God told Moses, you bring my people to me so I can deal with my, I want to have a relationship with each and every one of them. Yeah. When God came down. It was like, nope, Moses, you go talk to God. We're going over here. So Moses standing there like, okay, God, I brought them people here. Uh, and they, Well, Moses, I tell you what, could you go lead my people? Because they ain't ready yet. 40 some years later, they still ain't ready yet. Don't make mm. no sense. Okay. Mm. So where we at? Verse 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that thou a prophet. Our fathers worship in the mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Remember, we talked about that. So the worship place of these um of of the 10 tribes in the in the area here in Samaria they worship where this golden calf and all this stuff that was and back in Moses they thought that was Moses the place where Moses wanted them to to worship so they thought they were doing right but he said now these uh these other people there so our fathers which meaning those from the 10 tribes here they worship in a mountain that and he say that the Jeru as it was in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews, which came to the Jews first. But the hour coming and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh us to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and and in truth. What do you get from that? I mean, how do we worship God in spirit and in truth? You can't go to assembly. You can't go to the place where you can't go to what we meet at over there on um, Butts Road. You know, because thinking you're going to save your worship on Sunday for that place. But the same thing they did. Only time I worship God when I go to this temple, when I go to the assembly. But God said, you know, that false worship that both of y'all doing, it ain't, it's not what I intended. That's what he said in 23. He said, that's not what I intended. They going to the temple over here in Jerusalem. You going to the temple over here with your cap. Now, 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 now one of you right. He said, my intent was that you come before and you worship me, your only God, in spirit and truth. Have a personal relationship with me. Now, how did that impact your daily life when it comes to you worshiping God? Mm -hmm. Or how should we worship God? How should that impact your daily lifestyle when it comes to worshiping God? That's the question. Well, Pastor Dave, mm -hmm. I was just going to say, well, uh, when you asked the first question, but I just want to say that. You asking about worship him is great. You have to have a heart. You have to be, you have to have a heart. Um, you have to have Amen. a heart that's in pursuit of mm -hmm. a relationship with Christ all mm -hmm. the time to mm -hmm. worship him is spirit. And your heart has to be, your heart has to be in pursuit of him every mm -hmm. day. Mm -hmm. And 
to, to have an intimate relationship with him, mm -hmm. an intimate spiritual relationship mm -hmm. with him. This is and that, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Right. I was saying that also comes with spending time with him, you know, praying mm -hmm. and reading mm -hmm. your word. And yeah. not, not only just reading it, but applying it, you know, making it part of, of, of your life so that um, all that you've been talking about, you know, it's 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 evident in our, mm -hmm. our lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, Pastor Day, being being obedient to the father is, you know, okay. if you know, the word says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And um, mm -hmm. it's it's not where you see some religions. Well, we're not, we're not a religion, but you see some religions where people, they got this time of day, this time of day to go worship. And and it's like a formality. But is are you doing something because it's a practice or is your heart in it? Because God, the most high wants our heart, mm -hmm. you know, because if he if he don't if we don't have that heart, that relationship with him, we, we, we don't have our heart towards him, our heart. If he doesn't have our hearts, we're not in relationship with him. Mm -hmm. hmm. You know, Pastor, I, 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 I kind of um, I'm looking at this, and uh, and it, and it all boils down to this conversation between him and this woman, mm -hmm. and it's what the woman asked him for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She said, "Give me, give me this water, so I will not thirst anymore." without understanding what she's really asking for. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So he's pointing out in this entire verse, these verse, next verses here, mm -hmm. what's it going to take to follow him? What's it going to take to be a worshiper of, mm -hmm. of God? You know, mm -hmm. he, he's really pointing it out to her now, you know, and, and telling us the same thing. This is what it's going to take. You got to cut loose some of the, the you got to cut loose this world stuff in order mm -hmm. for you to worship me. Like mm -hmm. everybody's been saying, your heart has really got to be in it and you've got to get an understanding of who God mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say also, he has to become a priority. Um, mm -hmm. I know I hear Pastor Sam always say, we got to prefer God, but mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. basically, he has, we have to invite him into our daily lives mm -hmm. and make him a priority. Mm -hmm. Wow. Y'all say I love taking notes. Yes, Sister Monique. I was gonna say it's it's everything, it's everything that everybody said. It's daily when you mm -hmm. get up in the morning or when you're about to mm -hmm. rise or you're still laying there and you open your eyes, it's intentionally having God mm -hmm. in mind. Mm -hmm. That's that's loving one another. It's whether you turn on praise music, whether you're reading the scripture, whether you're praying or just communicating with him, whether you have thoughts of somebody, whether you take a negative conversation and turn it into something positive, is having him constantly in mind that you're adding adding him daily into the life that he's giving you. Ooh. Hallelujah. Best day up. Yes, sir. I want to give you an example. Like the day we were, you know, getting ready to go out from the station and everything. And I was joking to this one person about this other person. And um, it was just a joke. But, and they took it lightly. And, but the, the Lord told me after um, I got on the, um, got on the, uh, left the station, got on the route and everything. He said, call this person, apologize to them for what you, said about them even though mm -hmm. it was jokingly right and they both of them took it lighthearted right but you know when god tell you to do something we have to do it so because our heart is towards him mm -hmm. and and i didn't have peace about that thing till i did what he told me to do and after Amen. that you know that that's part of right. you know god is speaking to us daily He's speaking to us daily about all situations and different things. So when our hearts are towards him or mm -hmm. prefer him, then, you know, we will just be obedient to and do what he says. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Stokes. Amen. 
Um, I understand what worshiping in um, truth is, but how do you worship in spirit? Somebody want to answer that. Then I'm going to wrap that up and it's going to answer a little bit of that question too, but somebody want to answer that before I close it out because that's where actually we're going to close out at. Worship him in spirit. I'm going to close it out and gonna I'm going to answer that and give you this scenario that Christ gave me and Jones hit it. In the right spirit. So what is the right worshiping God in the right spirit? It's the right mindset, having the right principles. So all of us, you remember the Bible, the second Timothy is given for correction, for doctrine, for reproof, so that all of us may be mature in Christ, that we may be holy, whole, is right standing with God. So all of us is like that Samaritan woman. We have gone to the world. Now, remember, she was an Israelite. God's chosen call. She had her way of worship. She went to the certain mountain, the temple, like we do, place of worship, and we think that's true worship. And then we look at other religious groups, and they go to their place of worship, like the Israelites were doing, going to Jerusalem, when we're all wrong. Because that's not true worship. We're going to a place just like the whale trying to receive life physical life from something that's not that's temporal you know going doing these things these religious things that we do and think is worship they're temporal so here when we Christ said when I come into you when you come to me I'm gonna give you living water I'm gonna give you life the life that I intended you to have and through that life you learn through a relationship with me what worship is it's a matter of the heart so when you worship now in spirit, you now the Holy Spirit that he's given us, it communes with our spirit and it brings us into relationship with God. So our worship now becomes our lifestyle. So we're not worshiping at church or assembly to raise our hand, running around. It becomes who we are. And everybody just kind of says that. You know, Monique was talking about when we get up in the morning, that's the first thing we think about. Why? Because that's worship is who we are. I love that message going back to Pastor Stan was preaching. He said that we're all were created to worship something. You are either going to worship yourself or put stop in yourself, or you're going to worship God while we truly. Now, worship means that communion, that fellowship, putting him first. Christ brings us back into our true relationship. I love that word repent because repent means to bring us back to where we started. Restoration, he restores us back to our re restore. He brings us back to our original self. We were in Christ be before the beginning, before you and you and I were born. So now that worship is putting us back into that relationship with Christ. So worship becomes us. We are that. We don't have to go to worship. We don't have to go to a mountain, a church, or anything. We all, so our very lives that we live every day with Christ, that eternity starts when we say, yes, Lord. When we allow ourselves to be filled with that living water that called Christ through his Holy Spirit, now we become a part of him, a part of his kingdom forever. We don't need all this outward. All this, and we see that, all this outward stuff people do, and I'm not telling you not to do it. That's a form of, praise but how many times have we went to church and ran around spoke in tongues did all that stuff that we thought was worship but turned around and still couldn't stand so god is trying to say worship is that continued relationship and in fellowship with me that's worship not all this other stuff you can't not, forget what you're for see because she came she was a worshiper <laughs> she was a worshiper but god saying your worship including the worship of no matter what tribe you came out of, you came out of the two or the 10, no matter who was splitting all, all of y'all wrong. They going over here to Jerusalem, y'all going over here to another mountain, all of y'all, that is not true worship. Let me show you back. I mean, the true worship is when you come in the presence of me, when you come in relationship with me and you become that, now you become who you are. Everything that I want you to be, you are.
And that's a part of worship. Where now we don't, mm, don't want to say it too much because it's a part of one of my sermons. That worship becomes who we are. It's, we don't have to do it. We are it. We become it. We understand that worship is what you're worshiping God when you talk to somebody else. You're worshiping God when you go on your job. You're worshiping God in spirit with the right mindset now. Everything that you do is worship. That's why God said, when you do worship, don't defame me. Don't have others that say that I'm not your God when you worship. Because your worship is everything you do. It becomes a part of you. So now you don't have to, how to say, it? you don't have to conjure up something inside of you and, 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 and do all this stuff to say, now I got to get into the worship of God and all this. No, 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 no. That's not true worship. You are worship. So when you come before God, you worship him in spirit. You already enjoy him. The spirit that's in him communed with you. And in truth, just like this woman, we know the truth from a lie. Now we're truth tellers. We live by truth. We live by his constitution of word. We're in right standing with that's righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteous standing and right relationship with him. We are that. We become that. We stay there. We dwell in worship. We are worship. You don't have to go to worship. And I heard people still say that on Sunday, I'm, I'm going to worship. Well, good God Almighty, well, where are you going? I mean, you, if you're, if we all worship because it's the very sacrifice and the life that we give before God. How are you going to do something? You are something. So now you worship in the right spirit and you worship in the truth that God gives you to worship him. It's not a lie. The truth is you ain't got to go to no mountain that he's trying to tell the lady. The truth is you can worship me right here. And the end that was well, the woman said unto him, I know that Messiah coming, you the Messiah, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Truth. Jesus said unto her, this is plain. See, she understood this. I that speak unto you am he. She had an encounter with truth. She had an encounter with Christ that come to tear her all things. And he, the first thing he told her, you better get your life right with me so I can give you this living water. You can partake of me. To partake of me, you got to let this other stuff go. You got to repent. You got to turn from this other way of living that you've been doing and to receive of me. But now when we get to next week, when we look at the rest of this, that's when things get a little great there. Because now you're going to see she came, she left worshiping Christ. And what did her worship look like after she left? And what was the evidence of her worship? What was the product of her worship? Our worship should have product. See, when you running around, we clapping hands and shouting all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> <clears throat> jumping forward, who, who is it really glorifying? We say it's glorifying God, but the glorifying God is bring forth fruit. So we're going to see her truly now leave this mountain of worship. She's going to worship God in spirit and in truth, and it's going to cause others to do something too. Any comments, then we'll close. So we're going to hit that next week, and it's going to be great. It's so, going to be so great that the week after that, we're going to get y'all. Yes, ma'am. It sounds like what uh, Brother Tony shared earlier, uh, Tony Barnes, uh, when he, you know, he heard God, the Holy Spirit, tell him to call, call his colleagues. Sounds like he was um, worshiping in spirit then, too, because he was obedient to what the Holy Spirit told him to do. Yes. Amen. That's it. Okay. Worship is us. We are worship. And we worship God through being a worship unto him. And I know that sounds a little awkward, but we're going to see that next week. When this lady understands what true worship is, she does something that doesn't look like the worship that everybody else is doing, but it has better outcome than what everybody else was doing. And we're going to see that. The outcome, but she sure ran out and took them. Say it again, Pat. I said, well, I want to get into next week. <laughs> Go ahead. Say but it. She's laying out. And she she got up, she went running out and she said, come see a man that told me everything I'd ever done. I mean, she was excited. She she went and told people oh, about man. it. Oh, man. 
<laughs> oh man, you see you, now the definition of worshiping God is going to come out. We're going to see that next week because worshiping God does something through us to other people. It allows them to do something. That's true worship. It ain't see. So in other words, true worship. We're going to see next week. It's not about us. It's not what we do. Is who we are. And when we become who we are, like this lady's going to become, who she really is, she repented and returned back to her original states, is very attractive to the kingdom. Mm. Mm. Amen. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we got to pray because y'all making me do next week. Let's get out of here. Father God, we thank you. Lord, this word is so rich. Thank you for speaking through each and every one of us, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father God. Do, 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 co collectively, Father God, we get to understand what you're saying when each part of us, the body, as Ephesians said, we pro provide something to the other, Father God, that now when we come together, nothing is lacking. We have every viewpoint of your Holy Spirit that speaks to us. One of us can't hold it all. So it has to come through a collective body that we all become one, Father God, unto you, Father God. We all get the same knowledge and same understanding because we get it through one another. And it just builds upon each and every faith in what we have to say from your spirit. Bless us, Father God. As we go out to worship you from this point over, Father God, let us worship you in spirit and in truth. Let us understand that first, even before next week, that we are worship. Everything that we do, worship is representing you. Jumping into next week already, but it's worship is what we do. And we got the definition of worship sometime a little bit of wrong in the past, but we got it. We're getting it right now. Bless us, Father God. Keep our families. Bless those that still are lost within these two stars, Father God. We just something else out there brewing, Father God. You know, we, we prayed it on this last one. L loss of life was minimal. Break it on up. We, we don't need all of that in the name of Jesus, Father God. But show yourself strong. We thank you, Father God. In your precious holy name we pray. Amen.